Let's pray. Father, as we've given back to you a portion of what you've given to us, use it for your kingdom's sake, that the ancient words that we get to read and hear so readily would be able to be read and spoken around the world. Lord, uh, supply your church with all that it needs to continue global proclamation of the gospel. May we do our part here and use what we've given for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, choir, for leading us in that and reminding us of ancient words that uh, guide our steps today. Uh, please turn in your Bibles to those ancient words that God gives to us to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 13, the very last verse of that chapter and of this letter, uh, it's a, a, a verse that's often used by myself or Mark uh, as a benediction. So you are probably familiar with it, but we're going to take some time today to look at this one verse in closer study. So 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and if uh, they've not gone yet, children are dismissed to children's worship. I'm assuming they've already gone. I'm, I'm late. Let's read from God's holy word, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, God's holy and inspired word. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, Lord, we are thankful for your word, these ancient words that still have meaning and truth for us today and will always have meaning and truth. They will endure forever. And we ask, Lord God, that you would plant these words deep into our heart. Every time we open your word, that you would teach us new things about yourself and about ourselves and about how we live before you, and uh, that that would be true today as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, it comes as no surprise to you that pastors are a, a little bit weird. Um, sorry, Mark. Uh, I'll just make it more personal. I'm a little bit weird. Um, I, th this may not be really too weird, but um, I, love, I love exploring and looking at uh, old historical churches, like when I go to a, a big city or a different city, uh, looking at, wandering around, uh, taking tours of, if possible, some of these older churches. And um, in particular, I really enjoy uh, being able to, if I can, stand in the pulpit of these ancient historic churches. It gives me the sense of what these other preachers from a, another era uh, did as they were in these pulpits, oftentimes raised pulpits, high pulpits, um, and uh, it's just a lot of fun to be able to see what they saw, what they looked out upon, and so forth, and uh, maybe to pretend that uh, I, too, was uh, John Calvin. Uh, so uh, St. Peter's Cathedral in Geneva is probably the funnest or the, certainly the oldest pulpit that I've stood in uh, where Calvin preached in Geneva. Uh, I had the privilege of standing in uh, the pulpit at the Cadet Chapel on the Westminster, or not Westminster, West Point uh, Cadet Chapel at the Military Academy, which I believe Stu has also stood in that pulpit and preached. He got to preach there. I just pretended. Um... I've, I stood in the, the pulpit where, uh, where the late Harry Reader, uh, or no, not late Harry Reader, he's still alive, right? He passed. Harry Reader just passed, right? So in uh, Briarwood Church in Birmingham, uh, looking out at that, at that huge sanctuary. Um, but perhaps one of the ones that made the most impact on me, at least the one that I'm using for this illustration this morning, and that is... Uh, the, the high pulpit in Grace Chapel on the campus of Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. That's where I went to seminary, and there was a chapel uh, pulpit where you would have to climb six or seven steps to get up into the pulpit, and uh, 
On the pulpit, there was a brass plaque, and I believe I've mentioned this here before, but the plaque simply read, Sir, we would see Jesus. Or, Sir, show us Jesus. Or, we need to see Jesus. That was what was printed on this plaque. It was a reminder to the preacher that as he opened the Word of God, no matter where it was, from Genesis to Revelation, that my job, the preacher's job, is to show you Jesus, to make Jesus clear, to present him to you. And that's, that's what this series is about. That's what this series is particularly designed to do, is to show you Jesus. Over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at some of the theological terms that surround the whole idea of Christ's person and work. More his work than his person, but we'll look at his person as well. And that's our goal, is to, to show you Jesus. That hopefully you, you get that every Sunday, no matter what the passage is, you get to see Jesus. But even more particularly now, that we enter into this series. And so today, what we're doing is we're beginning with what theologians call the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption. Uh, the speaker at uh, our women's conference a year or two ago, Sarah Ivel, uh, many of you will remember her, uh, defined a covenant as God's sovereign initiation to have a binding relationship with his people founded in his grace and promises and secured by his own blood. So again, God's sovereign initiation that God initiates it's a binding relationship. It's founded in his grace and promises, and it is secured by his own blood. Uh, the parties, however, of the covenant of redemption are not God and his people. All of the other covenants that we look at in the scriptures, uh, the renewal of the grace, the covenant of grace throughout redemptive history, uh, and the covenant of works are, are covenants between God and his people. This one this is not uh, about God and his people. It's about the covenant that exists, the unity that exists within the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the, the covenant they've made with each other, their eternal counsel, their eternal conversation, their eternal promise and agreement to save a people, to save a people. It's a covenant that, established, that was established in eternity, and this council that exists between the three persons of God. Uh, theologian Herman Bavink uh, wrote this about this covenant, and he called it the council of redemption. He says, first of all, it's a council that precedes things. So if you look at Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, Remember this and stand firm. Call it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accompany all my purpose. It's a counsel that takes place in eternity where God sets forth his plan of redemption. It's this council, Bob Inc. goes on to say, between the three members of the Godhead that works all things, that, that has everything under his sovereign control. From Ephesians 1, we read this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He does all things in, in union, in uh, a unity within the Godhead. He carries out all things that take place throughout all space and time. Uh, Bob Inc. then also says, it is this counsel that speaks primarily of redemption. It's a, it's a counsel. God's eternal counsel is primarily focused on redemption. From Isaiah 43, we read, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. He says that to his people. It's what he says to his people throughout all ages. I have called you, you are mine, I have redeemed you. And we also read in Galatians 4, this is our uh, theme verse from 2022, 
as a church. This was the verse that many of us memorized. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. This gives us the idea when it says when the fullness of time had come, like there was a plan, there was a plan for a specific time that God had in mind and it was something that was part of his eternal counsel before the foundations of the earth were laid that he would send forth a redeemer at the fullness of time to redeem us who were under the law. So what we find throughout all of Scripture, all of redemptive history, is that there's an overarching meta-narrative. There's a story that is told that tells us that our triune God is united together to redeem sinners and reconcile them to himself. Our triune God is united together to redeem sinners and reconcile them to himself. It's in the mind of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that he sent a Redeemer, his own Son, the second person of the Trinity. Now, the title of the sermon, if you looked at it on the bulletin or it'll be on the website, is Triunity, and that's not really a word. Um, it was my attempt to the, refer to the unity found in the Trinity in one word, but now I'm explaining it, so I should have used more words. Um, but we all know that the Trinity does not include you, the letter U. And no, the Trinity does not include you. You are not part of the Trinity. But that's beside the point. There is a unity that exists within the Trinity. And it's in that unity that we find this covenant of redemption. So let's, let's look at this verse. Let's see what Paul tells us uh, by the Holy Spirit about the, the triune God. And, and in fact, let, let's just be clear about this, that this verse uh, is one of the verses that we go to in Scripture to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. There are others that mention the Trinity, but the word itself is never used in the Bible. But this certainly tells us there is a triune God made up of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's begin with the saving act that the Father agrees to initiate election election that's the that's the uh the saving act that the father agrees to initiate uh, it is the love of god the father that elects us and an election election is the way uh that we choose things right it's it's based on how much we love that particular thing uh, for instance uh, this past thursday night uh, as pastor, I get to attend the rehearsal dinner for these weddings that I do. And at the rehearsal dinner, uh, Gary had made uh, four different flavors of eclairs for dessert. Uh, chocolate with the traditional Boston cream filling and chocolate with chocolate filling, uh, plain with raspberry filling, and then a lemon with lemon fill filling. So, so out of my love for eclairs, which one did I choose? Yes, all of them. I heard that. Yes, all of them. Now, I did only have a piece of each of them. I didn't have four full eclairs as much as I wanted to. I, I exercised a little bit of discipline. But that's, that's what election, I elected to have a piece of each. I, or I could have elected to just have one whole one. It's the way we choose things. It's the way that we decide what we're going to place our affection upon, right? So motivated, motivated out of his great love for his people, God the Father chooses to save some. All of mankind, because of our sin, because of this universal condition that we find ourselves in, are sinners and all doomed to perish. But God in his love and his mercy chooses some for salvation chooses to save some. He places his love upon us and he makes us his. The Bible calls those whom the Father has chosen the elect of God or simply the elect. Like Paul says in Titus 1, he says in his beginning to his uh, protege, Titus, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect 
and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. So he's, he's calling the people uh, in the church in, in, uh, where Titus is ministering in Crete to, uh, he's calling them the elect, the chosen ones. He also says in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us, even as he chose us, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he goes on to say in verse 5, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. So God chooses whom he will save before the foundation of the earth is laid. And his choice is not based on anything to be found in us. This is where we, we use that word unconditional to speak about God's election. That, that second point of what we call the five points of Calvinism or the doctrines of grace. That his, his election is not conditioned on anything that he sees in us because as he looks at us prior to Christ, he sees nothing good. So it's based fully on his love. It's based fully on God's love. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that it's not based on anything with us. Because if he were to, he were to look through all the earth and, and choose all those who were good to be with him in heaven, that apart from his work, heaven would be empty. There would not be one person there. The universal human condition of sin means that apart from God's presence in our lives, none of us stands fit to stand in his presence. His presence must be first in our lives for us to be present in his kingdom. He came to us, though, right? He came to us, Emmanuel, God with us. And we'll look at that more next week. Next week, we're going to look at the incarnation. But why did he come? He came, he came because of his love for us. Right? We read that in uh, John 3, 16, that most famous of Bible verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or we read of his love for us in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What great love the Father has for us. He's lavished upon us that he calls us his children. So it's the Father who initiates this action. He's the one who begins it. He's the one who starts the process of redemption. He initiates his promise to redeem and the fulfillment of that promise. He brings it about, and he brings it about for us. He makes good on his promise in space and time. That, that promise that was made in eternity, he brings to fulfillment in our very lives. And he does this through redemption. The redemption by his son. So from 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Redemption comes to us through the grace that Christ demonstrates and dispenses to us. Now we know that grace is a, is a gift. It's it's a, a kindness. It's favor. It's that which affords joy and pleasure and delight and sweetness and charm and loveliness. Redemption is that act of buying back, right? Paying a ransom price, paying a price for something that's been placed in another position. Um, you know, as a kid, I always, we went around the neighborhood gathering aluminum cans. And we had about an eight-inch long section of a railroad uh, rail. So it was heavy metal, and we'd use that to crush the aluminum cans. And so we'd collect cans, bring them to the redemption center or the recycling center. But they were redeemed, right? And also you had those little cans and... and uh, I remember when I was at Dort, it was just totally new to me that you would save your cans and turn them back into the store and they would give you money back for your empty can, a nickel apiece. Redemption, buying it back. That's what Christ has done for us. He came to buy us back, to buy us out of slavery. We get the best picture of this at the cross 
But prior to that, we get that in Egypt, right? As God redeems his people out of Egypt, out of slavery. That's why Moses is said to be a a type of Christ, a, a, a foreshadowing of what Christ would do. Redeeming us, paying a price for us. We, uh, we just went through um, uh, the confession, the shorter catechism, these same two questions during the uh, confession of sin, or uh, no, it was during the confession of faith. Just let, let's read through them again. Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? God, having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity, elected some to eternal life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. And who's the redeemer of God's elect? Well, the only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God became man and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. So the only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ. Who who is there that's in competition with him? Who is it that we might look to instead of the Redeemer? Well, if we're wise, we would look nowhere else. But we still get caught up in the folly of sin, the folly of our idolatry, the folly of self-righteousness, and we often look to ourselves to be our own redeemers, that it's our good works, it's our outweighing the the bad in our lives, right? As long as I have more good in my life than bad, then I'm okay. Well, that's not true because the bad is still there and even my good is as filthy rags before God. So your, your good works are not enough to redeem yourself uh, because God's standard is perfection. His standard is perfection. We cannot attain that. Uh, Your mom and dad may be good people, but their good works are not enough to redeem you out of your sinful state. As much as you might think the goodness of your parents or rest on that or your own goodness, it just does not work. No amount of good works, no amount of money could pay the debt. No amount of anything can pay the debt. Only Christ. And the price of our redemption was the infinitely valuable blood of of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is sufficient to pay for the sins of every person who has ever or will live. But it's efficient, it's effective to fully pay for the sins of all those whom the Father has given to the Son. All of the elect, all whom God has chosen, their sins are fully paid for, not just made possible, but it fully pays for, fully atones. Uh, Another term we'll look at in a few weeks. The love of the Father is the basis for his election of those who Jesus redeems. And that's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that is the basis of his redemption of those upon whom the Father has placed his covenantal and steadfast love. All of the elect are then brought into fellowship. All of the elect are then brought into fellowship, into the body. It's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. This word fellowship, uh, many of you may know that uh, the Greek word that's behind it is the word koinonia. Koinonia uh, has to do with a, a, a deeper fellowship than just what we do when we stand around and, and talk around the coffee pot or Uh, the cooler, the water cooler. It's more than just casual conversation. It's, it's, It's deeper than that. It runs deeper. There's a greater intimacy that we find when we engage in the fellowship. Um, and it's, it's really the idea, uh, that we find in the Bible of sharing or of participation in. It's participating in things together. So like when we gather for worship like this on Sunday mornings, we are enjoying sweet fellowship. We're participating in the fellowship of the saints as we gather to worship our God. It's what we experience when we gather in our life groups and we talk about the weather, we talk about 
uh, work and we talk about other things, but then we get to the nitty gritty and we start talking about each other's lives and we start talking about the things that are discouraging or difficulty, d- difficult or troubling. And we begin to talk about how Christ is the answer to those things and how he helps us walk through the trials and uses them to grow us in our sanctification. So that's, it's a deeper fellowship. It can begin, and it's all right to have conversations around the coffee pot or around the water cooler. It begins there, but that's not all that, that it is. There's much, much more that we're brought into, into the fellowship of the body. Here, here's how J.I. Uh, Packer uh, spoke about fellowship. He says the Greek word for fellowship comes from a root meaning, common or shared. So fellowship means common participation in something either by giving what you have to the other person or receiving what he or she has. Give and take is the essence of fellowship. And give and take must be the way of fellowship in the common life of the body of Christ. And the fellowship that we enter into or are drawn into is a fellowship brought about by the Spirit. He is the one who unites us to Christ and to each other. Paul talked about this in Philippians. He said, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. There's this whole unity that exists when the Spirit unites us together in our faith in the Lord Jesus. That we have the same mind, we have the same spirit, we have the same love. We're of full accord. John the Apostle spoke about this kind of fellowship on two planes. Uh, the, The vertical fellowship that we have with God that's brought to us by the Spirit. We are we are made one with our Lord. Uh, Christ abides in him, he abides in Christ, we abide in Christ, we are brought into this amazing relationship with the triune God by the Holy Spirit. And then there's this second plane upon which we know uh, fellowship, and that's the horizontal plane, this fellowship that we know between brothers and sisters. But there's a priority, isn't there? There's a priority that the first one must exist for the second to exist. The first relationship must be present. We must have a right and reconciled relationship with God if we're to have right and relation, uh, reconciled relationships with each other. That one is the priority, the one we have with God. That's the one that unites us with him for all of eternity and one to another for all of eternity. So the fellowship of the Holy Spirit finds its basis in the redemption of Jesus Christ, which flows from the love of God the Father as all three persons of the Godhead unite to save us. God does it all from beginning to end. And he did it through his son, the Redeemer, the one who became man, left heaven to become a man and to walk among us. The one who was perfect in every way, never sinned, never yielded to sin, never yielded to temptation, yet he struggled with temptation the same manner we do. But he never yielded. He never sinned. He was perfect in all his ways. He is the the one who, in his perfection, gained for us a righteousness that is not ours, that he gives to us so it can be ours. It's a righteousness that comes from outside of ourselves, and that's the only righteousness upon which we can depend. It's the righteousness that comes from Christ. He's the one who, in his righteousness, performed miracles and spoke beautiful teachings that we would know him, we would know the wonders of our God, his divine nature and his human nature. He is the one that willingly went to the cross for you and for me. He went there knowing he was going to give his life, though he did not deserve it. That he was going to give his life for sinners throughout all time that God had chosen before the foundations of the earth were laid. That he would, in real space and time, give up his life for you and for me. 
and that he would be placed in the grave for a time and he would experience the pangs of hell on our behalf so that we would not have to do that. And that he was raised from the dead and he, was, he, and he ascended into heaven and he is seated in his rightful place at the right hand of the Father from which he continually intercedes on behalf of his people. This is the one who reigns in glory and will come again one day to bring his people home. Those whom the Father has elected from before, the time, before time began, that the Son redeemed in real space and time, that the Holy Spirit has taken and united to each other and to the Father. It is these that he will come for and bring home to live with him forever in glory. This is the one we proclaim. This is the one who has redeemed us. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise him in all of his glory, that his glory was earned, his glory was found as he redeemed his people upon the cross. Worship this Jesus. Trust this Jesus. Love this Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for showing us Jesus today in the midst of the Godhead, in the midst of our triune God. But we get to see Jesus, the Redeemer, the one who came to save, the one who changed our lives forever. Lord, uh, continue your work in us, and may we fully trust and worship you, for you alone are worthy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I invite the elders who are helping administer